three. So again, my name is Patricia Codner. I am new to Holton Catholic. I joined this board in April, and uh, it's been a journey since. I'm enjoying it, and um, just was delighted to be part of this day, even though it was anxiety provoking. <laughs> but um, I'm also learning ways to cope and deal with this kind of stress. I have the pleasure of working with Oliver, and uh, let Oliver introduce himself, and then we will start our presentation. Hi, my name is Oliver Fusi. I'm a psychological associate, and I'm the uh, chief of psychological services for this board. I have been in this position um, uh, officially as an employee for about uh, two and a half years, but I have worked uh, on contract with the board before, so since 2004. So I know the board fairly well. Um, the issue of mental health is uh, a very new topic in, in the terms of intensity that is being addressed in the board uh, from the <coughs> position. I uh, usually work with uh, our uh, psychology staff mostly in terms of assessment of learning difficulties and um, related uh, assessment needs and I'm also responsible for the speech language pathologists and communicative disorders assistance for the board. So what I'd like to ask you to do is just to take a moment, take a deep breath, because without breathing we don't function, but just to, if you can, for an hour, park your issues, anything that you have concerns that may be weighing you down. We know parents, we have children, we have to take care of them. A lot of concerns come with that. But in order for us to learn today in this group, we need to free ourselves of some of those concerns so we can embrace the learning. I'm also recognizing that there's going to be a lot of slides we have up here that is not going to be new to some and to others it will be. But we're hoping whether it's going to help you increase your capacity in learning or it's going to affirm what you already know and also that you're going to leave here with a little bit, one tool, or a little bit more information that's going to help you to deal with your children, your family, your friends, and if you're a teacher, your students. And so we're going to invite you to ask questions if you have them. We, ha we tried in the first <coughs> session, and I'm going to use some of that problem solving skill that we are gifted with, I hope, is that I quickly glanced through the evaluation by the way, it said good, <laughs> but it, what it did say was that there was a lot of slides we have which we parroted what the slide said. We didn't need to do that because you could read. So we're going to try and correct that one. And secondly, my voice tends to go down to a very soft, couch-like voice, so I'm going to try and keep it up. So if it's going down, just do this, <laughs> I'll get it back up. And uh, what was the third thing? The third thing was to be able to have more opportunity to understand what happens within our system, meaning our board, in terms of navigating the processes and getting access of service for our students. We had to rush because we spend a lot of time with the mechanics of all the various disorders and I think a lot of parents want to know how do you navigate in the school system and if, if, if that's the, what you want here let me see you want to understand how to address mental health in the school for your students or for your children then we're going to pay more attention to that in the slides here. Okay. I love this um, this uh, smiley face and one of the things that we've learned over the years is when we say mental health, people think mental health disorder. They just tack it on. Mental health, we all have. Everybody. And so what does it mean when we say mental health? We need to message that mental health is a positive thing. We need to get it out of the camp of being negative because it, then it stops us from moving forward. It creates a stigma, a cloud over it. People don't want to talk about it. People get uncomfortable. They start to go within, rather than being out and be able to come to converse. And so we just have a YouTube clip which will quickly get us all on the same positive note, and then we will start the presentation. <coughs> I think I'm a hard worker, and I put a lot of effort into school, and I never take my degree for granted. I think that's really important. I like to have really high goals because, you know, you achieve the goal and then you push on even more. 
friends are someone that has to do that, and uh, I have great friends. I honestly, like myself, I, I really do think I am a good person. I feel that just having a really good positive attitude is the main thing that helps. Most of us know the basics of good physical health. A proper diet, exercise, taking care of yourself to avoid getting sick. But what about good mental health? This too is important for living happy, fulfilling lives. Just as a balanced diet and exercise are hallmarks of good physical health, there are hallmarks for good mental health. And that is what this program is all about. To get us thinking about what it means to be mentally healthy. <clears throat> So as we set the stage then about when we say what is mental health, what we're going to take you through is from the large to the small. Start with the world we live in. It's become the buzzword, if you want to use that language, but it's definitely on the radar in most countries, especially the, the, the developing countries. And so we're the, the World Health Organization gave us a definition of what that is. I'm not going to read it. But it, it clearly indicates it's the absences of disorder and the ability to manage regular stress in our lives, be productive, fruitful, and live healthy lives. That's what we mean by mental health. When you get into how do we promote that and achieve that, we now know it's not just something that is going to happen either just in the home or just in the school or in other domains. We have to take the silos off and we have to make it a whole community event for mental health to be established. Because if we're not healthy at home, and we need help outside of the home, and we're not getting it, then it's going to start impacting the, the community life as well. So it's really just looking at the whole child, the whole person, and looking at the community in which they live in, and making sure all domains are functioning um, appropriately. And. Uh we uh, just picked another example of a country, uh, country strategy for mental health, and um, because it, it shows how universal uh, the approach to mental health is, in that some of the themes that were mentioned here, uh, they call them key aims, are quite uh, similar to what we are doing. So we're working on eliminating stigma that mental health is something that can be talked about uh, openly, that, that uh, students and parents and uh, educators feel free to um, talk about in a way like we talk about other things, as sports and homework and literacy. Um, we want to raise awareness um, uh, within our system and in the community. Um, we want to prevent more serious effects of mental illness. Um, and we want to promote recovery. So you can see in, uh, embedded in there is kind of like a tiered approach from promotion and prevention to, uh, to uh, response to more serious problems. But trying to prevent uh, the extent of those problems by promoting well-being and starting before um, issues arise. And this is another way of, of, of uh, talking about a continuum um, of children that cope well, where we uh, are working on building assets. And you will hear this word a couple of times in our uh, presentation, and you will see it on our website and in, in the region. How do we build assets internally and externally that children grow up with so they are a bit more immune, if you want to uh, express it that way, uh, to the effects of uh, stressful events. Um, and then we want to, uh, on, along the spectrum, recognize early when sh children show signs of mental health difficulties, as well as responding to uh, more serious um, situations. One of the things we want to be mindful of is what we're saying is that we know that there's going to be a percentage of our student population that regardless of what we do, because they have a propensity to have a mental health disorder, that they're going to have that. But what does it mean when we intervene early? It means that they're going to have cope, better coping skills, they're going to have less incidents that will keep them back from growing and maturing. We have many adults 
who have a disorder who are functionally just well because they have the assets, as we heard, in their lives, but also they had the interventions in, in a timely fashion. And so the students who are not have a who do not have a propensity for a mental health disorder but are exhibiting behaviors that are a mental health issue, same thing. If we are able to intervene early, then we are able to minimize the trauma and the impact of when they have a, a, an episode of some kind, which sometimes can be very, very detrimental, physically or emotionally. And so the whole idea is for us to understand child development, the whole child, the whole person, and then when we start looking at when they're starting to struggle to catch it early so we can intervene, provide services, give them assets and coping skills so that can, they can manage throughout their growing years. And this is not just for students, it's for all of us really, because <coughs> mental health is from your born until you die. Yes. Are we going to speak about any of those signs to look for? Yes. We will. Oh, okay. yes. I just read them. Yes. Yeah. And, and the way that we're starting about it is uh, with this slide, um, we're going to talk about a couple of um, uh, observations that you may have um, that are normal. Because the, tr the tricky thing for you as a parent and for us as, as, as people working in education is how do we distinguish between uh, the normal variation of behaviors to when is it really a concern. Now, um, you, the, the, the examples that we're showing is, uh, are related to things that can happen in adolescence. But I want you to understand that we're really thinking about um, children at all, from all ages. Although some of those mental health difficulties manifest themselves uh, more in the early teen and late teen years, uh, we realize that anxiety, for example, can be something that we see much earlier, <coughs> even at a clinical level. Um, what we're going to talk about now is adolescence. And um, uh, this is an example uh, of a couple of slides that we um, took and borrowed from Dr. Stan Kutcher, who is uh, one of the leading researchers in terms of teen mental health in Canada. And um, I will go uh, to his website. We'll, we will show you his website um, um, in a little while where you can go and you can get all kinds of very interesting information uh, in, in, in um, slides like this and then modified slightly and, and videos and, and all kinds of useful information about um, uh, problems in uh, normal teen development. What you see here is uh, uh, data that was actually taken I think from this region and what you can see here is um, responses from students in terms of how sleepy they feel during different times of the day. Uh, and what you will find interesting is when you look at the time slot between 8 and 10, uh, that's the highest time of sleepiness for a teenager. What are they supposed to do at that point in time? Sleep. Sit here and learn, right. right? And then when they're less sleepy, <coughs> 6 to 8, they're hanging out in the mall, mm -hmm. right? So what does that tell us uh, in terms of how we should really have our day schedule? Um, so there's a lot of information in terms of um, research in terms of the sleep needs of adolescents and teenagers. For example, we know that teenage, the teenage brain is developing so much uh, in that time period that they need uh, actually more sleep. And they have more sleep. It's just that they have it on the weekend. They, they, they catch up on the weekend. So it is uh, perfectly normal for a student to, uh, who's a teenager to sleep until um, 2 o'clock on a Saturday because that's when they get the amount of sleep that they require. So um, it helps us understand a little bit also as a parent in thinking, oh, my, my, my son or my daughter uh, doesn't have a disorder, they're just teenagers, and, and, and how to talk with them about their needs. Now, um, uh, the teenage years and adolescence in general <laughs> has been recognized as a period of change for a long time. And you see the, the, the quote there with a little bit of old language that kind of uh, shows that, that uh, hundreds of years ago, 
uh, teenagers were the teenage years were recognized as as a as a mo as a period um, in which there's a lot of development and, and unusual behavior changes going on. And uh, in literature, Goethe, the the sufferings of the young author. Uh, even spoke about the, the tendency, you know, to see everything absolute and, and to 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 get to a point where suicide is contemplated. Um, and, and, uh, something that we see nowadays, which which is very uh, problematic in 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 our present times, uh, because uh, uh, the teenagers uh, have uh, the tendency to uh, to extreme reactions, and we know that the frontal lobe part of the brain that has to do with uh, long-term thinking, long-term planning, inhibition and, and thinking ahead and, and seeing things in context is developing up to the age of 25 and is not developed at that time. So um, here you can see a little example of a youngster who got in trouble uh, in his teenage years um, and this is the first pop quiz of the presentation so who can tell me who this youngster is? Okay. Excellent. Very good. Um, and what is the outcome? <laughs> How is he doing? Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good, I would say. So, um, so it's a good caption to show you that a lot of things that we might have identified as problematic, I mean, obviously he was in trouble because he was driving without his license, but it's now having the reasoning power at that age to decide that, wait a second, the consequence of this is right but it's normal developmental process that they go through and so yes they're going to need a lot more guidance from us as much as they'll receive it but it is a very common thing for a young person to make those kind of decisions um, as i mentioned there's a lot of changes in the brain and you can see more on that on that website and, and we love that that uh, that kind of that line uh, describing the teenage <coughs> brain as a turbo turbocharged car with an inexperienced driver. That's what it really is. And it's a huge factor in terms of even if, when you think of the adults dealing with the adolescent or the teenagers, we need to have that knowledge present in our own minds because what happened is we're looking at our youngsters today, and particularly even more now, young people are developing physically so much quicker. And we expect the brain to be on the same path, but it's not. So the brain is still back there, still playing catch up, but when you're looking at them, your expectation of them is way far exceeding what they're capable of doing in their decision making. You know, I've told you three times, you're supposed to do this, 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 this. Why aren't you doing it? Well, you know, they're still back here in your brain trying to process it. So we, we, we need to be more um, cognizant of that. So in our own interaction with them, we're going to adapt that lack of knowledge and wisdom, and, and then how we interact with them has to change. How about you say the slide you had there with the, the, uh, the sleep, you know, the kids who, um, that one there, yeah. Yes. And then, and then, um, and then you, you made a, um, Oliver made a comment about um, uh, that's okay because it's teenagers. How do you deal with the students? Who, I right. have them two of them who won't get out of bed. Right. I mean, literally but on the weekend fighting, or during the week. During school, I mean, I mean, right. and, it's, and then they won't go to sleep at night. Right, and, and then and then it, there is, for, for example, there's some projects where um, in the region where where school boards have been trying to address that by saying, okay, we're going to start school later. Mm -hmm and have it for longer. But one of the things that, uh, that's a good, good, good question actually, and a good example because um, what people have found then is, okay, so if we do that, if we, if we try to change the schedule to accommodate the, the needs of, a teen, of teenagers, that has to involve the whole community because if we just change the school hours, well, wait a minute now, how do they get their after school job that's a, at a certain time and, and all the other activities. So it's a kind of a, a, almost like a societal kind of change that has to happen. So this is just something that, that, that we are as a society realizing right now. How can we accommodate for that? It's not easy, like we don't have all the answers. It's just like a, a, a process of thought that we have to begin and say maybe we have to change how we were used to do things in, in terms of um, for example, the school hours and, and, um, and how you schedule activities uh, after school or on the weekend. If I, can just, if I can just, just a little more specific to your question though, you're, you're saying you have, when you say when students, and we have a lot of students who do not 
uh, have good sleep hygiene. Their hygiene is, t in terms of sleep pattern, it's totally off. Yeah. Because of all the variables. Some kids stay up all night playing video games. We know that. Yeah. And they can't wake up in the morning. So it's not a simple one-off answer yeah. in terms of, it's looking at a whole strategy of things in terms of the home, as well as in conjunction with the school. Um, a lot of it, too, is around what it is that makes this child not want it to be at school. What is, what, what's missing? Because if I think back when we were in school, I don't know about you, but me, I was excited to get up and go to school. What, what about that was it, what exciting for me? We are, we're starting to talk to students about that. Because just like how we did this presentation together, really, everything we pulled off the web, you don't have to go far anymore to get things. So is our students. So what would make a, a student come in the classroom to hear me speak? If they can go on the web and get it all, mm -hmm. what would be what, what would it be? What would you think it would be? Social interaction. Yeah, the relationship. Exactly. Yeah. How am I going to make them feel? What am I going to say that an added value that the web can't give them? Mm -hmm. What am I going to let them do in terms of their inquiry mind? Let them start thinking creatively. You, we can all learn now. I mean, we're in an age now where really, really, if you're a, a child who is bright and you are you have lots of assets, you really don't have to go to school. I mean, don't tell the world I said that. <laughs> like, but I think I'm challenging to say we have to change the way we teach. Because kids have no ways. I remember me looking at my encyclopedia. You're lying down and you're going to pay. You wait for it to come. That was exciting. Now we have to do our change in terms of the relationship, the dialogue. But I like to see schools actually, I mean, you can't change the school day. I mean, that's, you know, like you, you can't, the, like the work day isn't going to change just because I don't get up in the morning. I mean, so um, I, one of my sons has a, well, um, an IEP, a learning disorder, and he does English, um, what do you call it, like the applied English. And uh, the t he came home one day, and he normally hated English, but now he came home and he said, I love English. And I'm like, what is she doing that's you know, yes, like making exactly. him love the English? Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, English is his first subject of the day, and normally I couldn't get this, he was another son, I couldn't get him out of bed. He was telling me um, prior to the parent teacher meeting, he said, Do you know what um, Mrs. McConnell, that's her name, does? Uh, and it sounds funny, and it's, it, but it's obviously working. She had, um, the kids were coming in to say, I'm hungry, I'm tired, they were falling asleep. So she, and it was, it's not an old socioeconomic area, it's just that they weren't going to school with, with, they, with, they were, with, yeah. with for breakfast. So breakfast she put, she, she actually bought a coffee pot mm -hmm. and a microwave mm -hmm. and a kettle in. And um, she went to you know, Starbucks or one of them and got all these cups. And she, the kids, when they can come in in the morning, she sends them over to make coffee, make tea, and they bring in whatever they want, and they can heat it up in the microwave while they're at class. So I was asking the teacher, I thought, Colin's having me on. So I said to the teacher, do you do this? And she said, every single student in my class has an IEP. And she said, I, um, she said, I found very quickly, within a week or whatever it was, that they were all falling asleep on me. So I said, so you, this is what, and she said, yes. And that's exactly what she does. And it has worked wonders, because it's, it's been the spark that has woken them up. So something as simple as that, I, I mean. And that's the kind of creativity that we're starting to look at. We know that that's not going to be the solution for all the classes, right? But it's the unique, take an assessment, knowing your students, just like we're going to talk about knowing your children, and knowing where, where the needs are and being able to pad it up and mm -hmm. to build the assets around it. So all strategies don't work for everybody yeah, because sure. we're individuals, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And there's going to be individual pathways we're on that's different from the next student. So it's really being more intentional to look at every student and look at them for who they are, what their area of needs are, what their assets are, build the assets up pad up the, the, the areas that they're deficit in. And I mean, that's something I think we're, that's why the whole mental health now is part of school. <coughs> it's not <coughs> sanctioned off as separate from school. Right, you used yes. to come to school, you learn. That's all yeah. you came to do. Now we do more than that. We have to look at the whole child. You can't separate the brain, learning brain, from the, the brain that's dealing with issues. You can't do that, they're the same brain. Do you know, is sleep hygiene taught in schools part of health? It's a good question. I would say phys ed. I would say phys ed it would be. Because <coughs> I was in grade six and still hasn't had it. No, I don't and think so. And I know so. that 
there was a study that was on the news about a pediatrician in British Columbia. These kids are taking their iPods, their phones, into the bedroom and being texted at all hours of the day. And so some of that simple hygiene, which I know yeah. we get on the internet, yeah. but as part of smoking cessation, drug use, yeah. Yeah. it's a newer area that I'm wondering is should be incorporated. It's a great, it's a great point. And, and uh, we're, we're just talking about um, embedding mental health into the curriculum. Um, I know Grace Evans talking about it right now. And, and sleep as well, because we just had to record sleeping and oh. sugar. But how do, we, how do we start it earlier? Yeah. That's probably yeah. what we have to do, yeah. is look at a conversation well, of, of intertwining it earlier in all the, the levels, yeah. so that by the time you get to grade seven, yeah, it's it not... What do you mean I have to change my pattern? Well, it's too late. Because that, yeah. yeah, exactly. So again, that early addressing of these things might be a way of doing it. And I, and I think we are now focusing on that. And so we are at the table. You will see later on, we do have a leadership team at the board that is looking at from kindergarten to grade 12 about where we can embed things. And you know, because first of all, you also have to have the, the wherewithal to, to, to understand the information and do something with it. So it has to be age appropriate. But it doesn't mean a lot of what we're talking about is not simple tools like regular schedule bedtime, waking up on, you know, sort of that, the, what do you call them, the routines we have in our lives. Um, I just wanted to go quickly on that website to show you. Because um, what we wanted to do is uh, to show you um, um, resources that are um, evidence based. Uh, that we know are, are related to research and because there's so much out on the internet that it's so hard to, to distinguish between different things. Um, and, um, and just uh, two little pointers. When you go here, you can, you can look at the sleep, for example, because we're talking about also the teenage brain that, we, that I had spoken about. And when you go on sleep, you can find, you know, it, as it, again, this is focused on teenagers, but um, um, there's whole presentations on there, slideshows that uh, talk about the sleep uh, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, adolescence. So um, all those, that kind of information is on there and it's uh, like brand new research as well as um, um, mental disorders. There's all the various ones if you want to understand any particular one more. It's all here. It's all been vetted. It's all been tried and tested in terms of evidence-based practices that have been used. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, just there. So it's been this is Dr. Kutcher. Yes, oh, Dr. Kutcher. Oh. Yes. And so it's, it's called teen mental health dot org. Yeah. And are the teachers incorporating this as part of their interest? It is part. It's coming out. It will oh. be coming out. We there's, are working on that. There's two. There's two things. There's a, there's a, um, a curriculum that was done by some Catholic boards in the area yeah. that we're just discussing, and there's a, another research uh, for the curriculum from Stan Kucha, that which we have bought for the board in the summer that we're going to use as a resource as well. So, um, and we started talking about grade nine religion <coughs> curriculum, grade but nine and ten. ten, nine and ten, and. We're now starting to talk about uh, elementary yeah. as well. You know, as you, I'm sure you can appreciate that this is something that will take some time to get out into the entire system in a standardized way. So we have to be very thoughtful in how we um, message it out to our teachers, but we also want them to receive it in a way that's going to be positive rather than like an add-on or making more work. And you know, we want this to come out in a positive way. So we have to be very um, skilled in how we um, add, add it to the work that they're doing already. This is a, a quick slide I'll just go over with you, but it's just to emphasize the importance of when we look at our students, we have to take in the entire student, which is, you know, there's research that shows you the importance of making sure we recognize you have the student, the child, what does that mean in terms of the sphere in your life? It's about knowing who you are, what are your assets, what are your gifts, celebrating those things, and really be you know, in understanding who you are in relation to society around you. But then the other piece is we have to know that relationship matters. We know that. So in terms of intimacy, it's not just about 
a one-on-one -on -one relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, and wife. We're talking about relationship with your peer, relationship with your teacher, relationship with your neighbor, relationship with your pet. All those things increase empathy in us, and it allows us to mature and develop in a way that's very positive. And then likewise, our achievement in, in the sphere of learning, you know, uh, from a toddler learning, how to ride their bike or whatever, and going on, graduating from elementary school into high, into high school. I'm really pushing the fast button here. <laughs> but you know, in every stage, is, it's a, something of achievement. And these are aspects in our lives that build assets. It also then that finally builds resilience. So we want to make sure we always factor in the, the whole child, not just looking at it just at home or at school, but everything that encompasses who we are as individuals. Um, when we talk about mental health, illness at the, at the end of the spectrum for those maybe three or five percent of children uh, where in spite of our efforts they develop um, these, um, these kind of difficulties to that degree that they're diagnosable um, and maybe there are genetic vulnerabilities there as well. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a list and, and I don't want to go through it uh, unless you have specific questions. I just want to mention that um, one example that it, it is uh, becoming more and more obvious uh, nowadays that uh, even bipolar disorder is something that we see in adolescents um, where we have those uh, uh, big swings from, um, from uh, being like uh, in, in, in a state of, um, uh, of uh, of euphoria and, and being able to do everything and wanting to, to, to conquer the world and shopping and, and everything to fall into a deep, deep black hole and, and a deep depression. And um, that's something that uh, can uh, occur as well in adolescence. So, um, so it, it becomes then a more difficult task for the parent to, to distinguish between the normal variability and, and change that we see in, in those years where students, uh, where an adolescent is trying to find their self and their own identity and therefore changing and switching and, and changing their mind about things and, and dressing differently and having changing friends and so on to, to a pattern that is becoming a little bit more concerning. One of the things, too, at this slide that I really appreciate is when you think of um, mental health issues, having a mental health issue or disorder, one of the things that we really are working at at and Catholic is to get rid of the stigma. If you broke your leg and you went and had a cast put on, you wouldn't come back in with a label. And nobody's going to see you as just a broken leg. If you have a mental disorder or a mental issue and you have a label, there's a tendency to see the student in just that label. And what we have to do is say, no, it is an aspect of who this child is. This is an issue that they're dealing with. It's not their entirety. It's not who they are in their all of themselves, which is why we did that, that first thing with the spheres. We have different components to us. Who are we? I'm a wife or a mother or a sister, an aunt, a cousin, a friend. And in not every domain, I have an issue. And so maybe this little area I need some extra help with. But you know what? For the big piece, I'm OK. And so that's what we really need to do, because this is what prevents a lot of parents from moving forward to getting their child properly seen and diagnosed. This is also preventing students from going to utilize services to get help, because they don't want the label. Because it's how we treat them or interact with them when they have the label. And so we need to do a, a better job at keeping the label separate from the, the entire child. So I just want to make a point in case someone else finds themselves in the same boat. I worked for a mental health agency, not in, I'm not a clinician, but um, had a daughter who had a blip in grade nine. Turns out, for anyone who doesn't know, ADD is found in girls in grade nine primarily because they managed to get through elementary and And um, ended up going to see, uh, I was in the, on the process of seeing a psychologist. It's a brilliant and they're only here like half a day every two weeks or something. Um, the first thing is to meet with the worker. Everything was fine. She was all game for going. And we went down to Joe Brand and we walked underneath this label that says mental health services. And she turned to me and she says, great, now you think I'm mental. She was 14. And I thought, where does that even come, come from? from? I work for a mental health agency. <coughs> I'm thinking, no, 
was it. She was done. She sat there completely shut off. She was done. Yeah. After that, I wasn't even allowed to take her to get a diagnosis because she has a lot on the record. And that's one of the key things why a lot of our young people aren't getting the services they need is the whole umbrella that goes over them. And they just feel, oh my gosh, I'm everybody's shocked. going to know. Where does yeah. it come from? I think mm -hmm. we message it even when we don't know we are doing it. Something. We've been raised in, in such subtle ways that we don't even know any. Yeah. I mean, I look back now and I think of relatives where I hear people would say, it's a little bit funny to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one, I didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. Like Nobody really talked about it. Yeah. And so we have all, so I can go back now and I can actually pinpoint family members mm -hmm. who had serious issues that should have gotten help or some who've been put away. Where is so-and-so? Oh, they're gone to live somewhere else. Oh, okay. Usually if you're going to go to another country, somebody talks about it or you know about it, but they just disappear. But also it's the other kids, I mean, especially Something at 14. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I remember my kid was uh, four years old and never watched television, but how did he know about Batman? Um, how did he know about Dunkaroos, which I never bought because I was trying to maintain a low-carb, low-sugar diet? He was getting it from his JK pal. And so society yeah. has a huge impact on how we think and, and behave. Mm -hmm. And young kids see the extremes. <laughs> like, like young kids always see the extremes. They see, see the extreme or on, on shows, they see the extreme of you know, bipolar or whatever. Okay. And so they don't want bipolar on their label. Cause but they, remember their brain. Yeah. Where are they in brain development? Yeah. They're not yeah. using reasoning power. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why we now have this knowledge. We That sign there should not be there anymore. Clearly. <laughs> right? Yes. Because now we know what it's going to do to their limited brain power in reasoning that, you know, if my leg's broken and they go, they're not going to say, don't take me to the hospital. They are going to go to the hospital. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. we're just having to get the whole uh, art. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really sorry. And if anybody knows the passport they didn't hand in, I'll take that as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's a recess. So this way, when, when the day's over, you can see by the front door who all the draw with Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, we're going to have to speed up a bit on some yeah. of the slides because I want to get to the things at the board in terms of the school board, what we're doing. A lot of this information we're giving you, you can get from the websites. Sorry, we had one question. And oh, I was oh, just wondering, um, is it because they are so exposed to what we, like, for example, technology and also the label itself? Are we using the label maybe too often or we are mislabeling the kids perhaps? Well, I mean, it could be all of the above, but what I'm going to say to you from my own experience over the last 28 years in the field is that what I said to you about my growing up, nobody talked about mental health, you were put in a sanitary <coughs> or you were deemed, you weren't dangerous, you were deemed to be just a bit, you know, mm -hmm. over there. Rather, if we spoke about it and put the right interventions in and, 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 and dealt with that person, they could have had a much more beneficial life. And so we're at a place now where we're better able to identify and recognize, just like how we're doing with all the me in the medical realm, right? Cancer and all the things that we're better at detecting, we deal with it, but it doesn't have stigma attached. Somehow mental health does, because I think it, it takes over our entire being. You know, you say someone has cancer, nobody looks at you from head to toe and thinks cancer, they're thinking of, you know, where is it? Which, what kind of cancer do you have? They're finding the little spot. Whereas mental health takes everything over. And I, so, I mean, I think obviously society and the messaging we have and exposure will increase people's awareness. I think it's more because we're more knowledgeable, we are better able to identify, and I'm glad that we're identifying it because we have many people who are either incarcerated because they've done crazy things as a teenager and they needed help and they didn't get it. I would rather, you know, go towards more preventative in terms of um, helping our, our young people. Okay. Um, the important you can read this. The important thing is um, again to to compare what you're seeing in your child to a baseline and to see if this is a characteristic, uncharacteristic change, and always uh, talk to the teacher, talk to other parents. Compare your notes, <coughs> see if what you see is something that happens elsewhere too, so you can 
uh, measure this against what is a normal variation within uh, your child's development. Um, and again, it is important uh, to uh, work on building resiliency and strength, and that's what we're trying to do, uh, to uh, work more on a preventative uh, uh, level so that we have, uh, can reduce the number of times that we have to intervene. Uh, we talk about building assets, and um, there's a proprietary term, developmental assets, uh, but um, in a general way, there's internal assets. We're trying to build qu internal qualities that guide choices and create a sense of purpose and focus in external assets. Um, in terms of uh, mental health uh, disorders, I just want to, to name two examples quickly. One is anxiety. Uh, anxiety is normal. And that's when we talk about anxiety. As you say, uh, you mentioned maybe it's being overused. Um, uh, I think that the, we have to talk about those mental processes as, as something normal and a normal variation. Um, as long as it doesn't significantly interfere with your ability to perform and to, to be functional, it's a normal thing. But if it, if it, if it like rules your world, if it rules your, your life and interferes, uh, then it is a problem. And, and where we see it in the school with anxiety is uh, this child starts to uh, miss a school because the parent felt they, they should give them a break because they were uh, so anxious. And then it starts creating a pattern. They miss one day, two days, three days, and it becomes an attendance issue because it reinforced the child's avoidance. And uh, then we suddenly <coughs> have a severe problem in school that we can't get the kid um, into school anymore. So that's one of the most prevalent issues that we're dealing with. I'm going to use myself as an example. So Oliver signed us up to present here today, and. He forgot to tell me that the video camera was going to be in the room and that we're going to be videotaped and I was supposed to give my permission. So it's two parts to this. First of all, I don't like to do what I'm doing right now. It's not what I like to do. Put me in the background, give me the kids, I do what I have to do. I don't want to be in the front lines. But because I accepted certain jobs over the years, it, this is part of the job, right? You have to do a lot of public speaking and so forth. So my anxiety at the very early years when I started to do this was just like to the place where it was going to prevent me from performing. So I had to find coping skills, mechanisms that helped me deal with it. So I think I'm managing, I think you would agree, right? Okay. So then today comes and we're getting ready and then I heard about this. <laughs> Again, I'm back to that place of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But here's one of the things, and we do common practice we use, it's called cognitive behavioral therapy. I have to do some of myself. <laughs> and so that is, okay, why, are we, why is it being done? What is it done for? What are they going to do with it? And da 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 And so those are the things that helped me do this and ignore that right now. Mm -hmm. To say, you know what, I'm not going to let this stop me from doing what I'm going to do because I want to impart as much knowledge and wisdom that I have gleaned over the years to help parents that they can go in and do what they're doing. But yes, does it raise my anxiety? Sure, but it's not gonna prevent me from getting into this, I'm not gonna get into this area. So I do have anxiety. But when it gets in here, if I run out of the room, and I took my bag and I'm gone, then it's going to be a problem, right? So that's the same with our students. We know students are coming in with anxiety. We have um, test performance anxiety. We have standing up in front of the class to give a presentation anxiety. We have gone from class A to class B anxiety because they're a new group of kids. We have, there's just so many things. But it's when we give our, our students coping skills and make a mechanism to help them, the general population manage. When you see the ones that are not, then we have to get to the next level in terms of the type of interventions we put in place. So again, again teaching our students it's normal when I share with young people, when I used to do one-on-one -on -one therapy and tell them that I couldn't speak in front of the grad, they're like, what? Are you kidding me? Again, normalizing a lot of things that they think it's only for them and not for us. Did you have a question? No? Um, again, it's important, I mentioned that 
to compare, to see changes in, in, in your child. Um, um, how does that compare to their usual behavior? Um, it's important when we, when we uh, meet the child, we want to find out uh, when there is a problem, is there a vulnerability, is there a family history? Um, that can tell you a little bit um, in terms of the, 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 the things that you have to watch out for. Um, and so it's important that we work together as a community and be open to, without prejudice, to share our observations. Um, and not label them, but to, 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 for the teacher and the parent to work together and say, okay, I've noticed this change in the last two weeks. Um, what do you see? And just uh, be open to that conversation. And um, for, you, for you, never be afraid to ask your child, what's up? You know, I've noticed um, that you have stopped hanging out with your friend Johnny. What's up? Mm -hmm. I cannot put in any judgment to it because you know adolescents are really good mm -hmm. at detecting judgment statements. Very, very good. Their radar gets up before you even say it because they're reading your body language. So you want to, it's simple WhatsApp. Open your arms up because you're making the possibilities endless. Right? So when, rather than WhatsApp, you already decide what it is. You just, you're, you want them to tell you. No, you just simply say, what's up? Let the chips fall where it is, right? In the interest of time, yeah. I would love for you to watch this little video because I think it will show you what we talked about earlier about looking at the whole student <coughs> in terms of who they are. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. My name is Jordan Fagundes and I suffer from ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. This disorder severely inhibits my ability to learn, but I do not let it stop me. I've been an honor student for my entire high school career and will continue to pursue my dreams at university this fall. The most important thing for me is being able to talk about my disorder openly and feel accepted in my community. and I suffer from ODD, Oppositional Defiant Disorder, meaning that even if my intentions are good, I often come across as irrational and uncooperative, something in which only a few understand. But I need you to understand this in order for myself and others with ODD to have a successful relationship. Whether they are professional, educational, family, or loving, I need you to understand this. I've been the team captain of both my school soccer and basketball teams. I am an athlete. My name is Ricardo Moyne and I am bipolar. I have a hard time taking control of my emotions, primarily when I'm sad and happy. I also experience long periods of depression. When people are around me, they can't stand it when I'm sad, but they simply don't see my disorder for what it is. I need people around me who are willing to set a positive influence in my life and that are willing to understand the implications of my disorder, not people who turn me back against me. I love music and I will be attending an institute to study studio engineering as soon as I'm done high school. Now you've heard it, now you've felt it, now how do you see it? Now, change your view. But that's just a, a neat little clip that would show you what we started to talk about at the onset. That students, one of the barriers for students is the fact that if they do get identified with having an issue, which if, when we're in the know, we can help them better because like the youngster says, we need to understand what his, what's going to happen in the wax and weaning of his highs and lows. If we understand it, we're apt to relate to him better. And so that information is very valuable for us to know as a school community when our students have issues that are ident identifiable. At the board, we have a mental um, health leadership team which comprise of um, Oliver and myself as the co-chairs. And then we have, as you can see, I've got quite large multidisciplinary approach in terms of principal, vice principal, teacher, consultant, parent rep, 
And then most importantly, we have three student reps. And those students' voice are at the table that informs us and helps us in building the strategies that we're going to use to move forward to engage our community, to enhance their learning and build awareness. So we're really excited about this. We are in our second year of just getting this off the ground and it shows, the, it shows the seriousness of our board in recognizing that this is an area that is well needed and is very valuable for us to develop. So in terms of our strategy, what we're trying to do is uh, we're, uh, for everybody in the board, uh, we're trying to uh, uh, develop um, a basic mental health awareness. And everybody knows what we're talking about and um, has uses the same language. And then uh, for some of in the board, we uh, develop a uh, more deep working knowledge. So that includes um, our strategy to have some mental health leads in the schools, two people <coughs> per school, um, that we are going to train. We have chosen them, almost all of them, they're all, they're all, done. all done now. And um, those are not necessarily only special ed people in the school, but uh, they can be a teacher, a librarian, anybody that we're going to provide some training to so that they are partners <coughs> in the school for parents, for students, for teachers, that everybody can go to and ask a question and they can point them. Or if they don't know the answer, they, they can help them to know how, who to contact when there is a question about mental health. Um, and what it also does, it, it, it uh, takes away the stigma because you know you don't have to go to the council of school. Uh, but <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to say it's the end of session three. Thank you for everyone who helped and who attended our sessions today. Uh, just like to announce at this time our Indigo Kobo donation winner, and that's Alvaro Aguado. Um, so congratulations to you. And as well, please, if you want to see if you're a winner of one of the many other donations from our sponsors, come to the registration area and we will have those names posted. Thank you and have a great day. Do you mind if we take two more minutes just to quickly oh, yeah. flip through yeah, and show? Yes, yes. This tier obviously is going to be your social workers and your child and youth counselors when you need more intensive support and psychology, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so if you just keep flipping to our internal process, I want to show them the, just to let you know, the leads are not meant to provide counseling. They are like librarians, right? They're go-to. If a teacher needs some advice about, you know what, where can I get some advice? I see this behavior, what do you think it is? They're going to point them to using this process. This is going to be rolled out to our system soon, where it's obviously two approaches because elementary, they have access to different players. But as you can see the, the chart, mental health leads are positioned right next to where the student and the parent and the teachers are. And so we know that, um, if a teacher sees something and they talk to the parent, we're, we're suggesting talk to the parent, talk to the student. And then if they want another set of lens on it, is to speak to the mental health lead about who can I talk to in terms of getting social work, CYC, or external agencies involved. Some of our families we know don't necessarily want to use the lights. Um, in school services because of that stigma, they want external, they're going to be able to point them to the right external agencies as well. As long as the student is going to get the attention they need, we're good with wherever they are. As long as they're getting it, that's good. We don't want to prevent that by saying, okay, don't make referrals out because we know that's not the reality. We don't have enough staff internally to support every student in the way we would like to. So we do have to use our community partners. In fact, we're mandated to do that now, as Oliver said earlier. Um, one of the additional mandated piece came down this year will be um, the uh, mental health and addiction nurses. We are going to be partnering with them and they will be coming into our schools hopefully in the new year. So they're going to be helping us as well in addressing the mental health and addiction piece in our board. And this website is something that you should have on your fridge. Just like how you have the information about calling for emergency for medical, 
this is a really good website for accessing anything you want to do with mental health. Uh, the beauty of this website is, if you live in Halton now, but you're moving to London, Ontario, and you need services, you wouldn't know how to navigate in London because you don't know what's going on in London. This allows you to go in and search. You may not even have a label, but you know that your son or daughter or yourself, you need some help with anger management. You put that word in, and it's going to show you all the services in the area that you can start making contact with to find what you need to deal with. It's a really, really good website. So it's, um, I'll give it a site again. It's uh, eMentalHealth.ca. Yeah, e it's actually no, actually we did that, we added that oh, when we yes. got here, we, we were talking, we thought, you know what, we should give them that, yeah, no, yeah, no. So are those leads, are they going to be in elementary as well as yes, high school? Yes, yes. And will the parents be advised? Um, you, it will become, we haven't, we've just got the names now. Okay. So we have our sheets and now we're going to focus on them and the whole process about how we're rolling that out is coming out. And, and you just, will know about it. Yeah, just yeah. that you know, again, they are not like clinicians and so no. on. And we also have other processes that we just uh, developed. Last year, we have a multidisciplinary team for uh, like tier three uh, referrals that go through the school for the severe access. concern. And we have a whole process with special education consultants, uh, CYC social workers, uh, there's a, a lot of tiers and, and different ways to, to access mental health needs. But parents will be on the communication pathway in understanding who these people are in the school because you can also contact these people as a parent. The mental health need, is that uh, sort of a new position that the board is now hiring? No, it's not a position. It's, it's an existing teacher who has the passion, the increased knowledge because they've also gone to educate themselves. We have a, a lot of awesome teachers who have been doing this already on their own. They're the go-to people because people know who to go to them because they want to help the kid. So it's not a position in terms of a, a new job. It's an add-on. But they're happy to do it. Oh, yes. They're being serious. I know. <laughs> Hi, I'd just like to ask if Alvaro Aguado is still in the building, please come down to the registration area to pick up your Kobo. Again, Alvaro Aguado. Thank you. <laughs> Can you just, if you don't mind, it would really help us in our next going forward, if there's a next, <laughs> after your evaluation, if you could just fill out the evaluation for us, I'd really appreciate it. And I'll continue to answer questions until... This is fantastic information. Yeah. Thank very you. Well very, very, very Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think our board is uh, very, very serious about this whole issue. And uh, when you think of a Catholic board and looking at the whole child, you know, it's just a natural fit. Right? Mm -hmm. how, how do we start um, siloing their different issues? They're one child with. We all have different pieces to us that we need to address in the same way at the same time. I think it's got to be every single I think they have enough rallies, get togethers. I think anti stigma has to be number one. But it's but it's knowledge that takes the Absolutely. stigma away, right? Absolutely. It's knowledge to say showing the kids that's right. and what he's done. Exactly. Yeah. It's the knowledge that is not first of all it's something you're gonna catch. Because that's another thing some people stay away, young people stay away from each other. Um, or also that it's not the entirety of who you are, right? Just, you know, like some of the youngsters will tell you, yeah, I know when I'm flipping out. So, and we can teach those kids to tell their friends, you know, it's not good time to talk to me. We women know about a little bit about that, right? Each month, we will say, don't talk to us right now. <laughs> and, and that's a skill. That's something that helps because we inform. It's knowledge, right? Thank also, you very much. I should also say that um, uh, the whole mental health strategy Thanks. of the board came about for a um, student initiative. And uh, the former student member of our leadership team last year uh, brought us to an idea in terms of the stigma question. Uh, there were some very good ideas and activities last year for mental health uh, awareness uh, week. 
but it was kind of here and there. And so um, we decided that we're this year we're going to plan uh, that awareness week um, in concert uh, across the board, so that students uh, can be engaged in those activities uh, in every school. So um, that it's kind of like a general uh, effort in that way we're trying to minimize the stigma further. I'd like to send you out with this little thought. You might have read this gem already, but it's very powerful. It says exactly you know, what it does. Students, as well as adults, we're going to remember how people make us feel. We may not remember what they say, we may not remember what they do, but we will remember how we feel, how they make us feel. And that's something we're really trying to get our teachers to, to uh, recognize the power of what they have every day when they interface with our students and how the students feel when they leave and come in, leave and come in. They may not pass your course, they may not get a 90, but if they leave feeling really good, you know what, there's a lot in that asset. Because you know, we all have different learning curves. Well, you know what? I have a son who suffers um, with um, mental illness. And since he, he we lived in Australia before, and in Australia the whole, the, the whole approach was, don't talk about it. And he, he went around, um, you know, I'm different, I'm odd, I'm strange, I'm, you know, I don't want to kill. It was almost like a disease. People would run away from him. But since he's come here to Ontario, the, the whole sense of empowerment and the whole sense of um, self-advocacy and teaching him, to, you know what, you are okay, mm -hmm. you, you, you can learn and you will. He's achieving beyond belief. Mm -hmm. Here was a kid that we thought could barely make it through high school, where right. he'd, he'd struggle, and, but now he's, he's, he's in the, um, the academic. Uh, he's, he's already talking, in my college, he's talking university. He's, he's talking about the apply for scholarships. So there's a test because of the what we're talking about. And, and the, because the whole Ontario faculty board, the approach is um, be proud of who you are, and, and it, it absolutely works. I mean, my son is a living example. You should let him write something, a testimonial, or do something with he, that, because that's what we need. Yes. Yeah. Students really get empowered when they hear their voices mm -hmm. of the other students, right? Because we're adults, yeah, right? Yeah. We're, do we know? <laughs> well, yeah. it just it just affirms it even more, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.